Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. We've got a record number of people on the show, which is absolutely great. And that's probably because I've got the financial guru, commentator, and econom economy expert uh, with me, Justin Urquhart Stewart. I've also got Ali the physio on yet again, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. If you could put your questions in the chat box, please, that will be absolutely fantastic. It's down the bottom, as you know, and you click on that and up comes the chat box. I first met uh, Justin Urquhart Stewart when we were both working for Barclays. I joined as a tea boy and he joined as a management trainee and a leader and he said, got sent very quickly to Uganda and I want to ask him about that. I also want to ask him if he still drives a mini, mini minor 1964 and I also want to know if those uh, red braces were an accident or was that part of his branding. So Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. And the uh, first question is, did you really get shot at in Uganda defending <laughs> a Barclays branch? <laughs> uh, yes, it is true. I am the black sheep of the family. Uh, the entire family has been in the army since 45, 1745. And during that time, they've all been in the army and none of them got shot. I'm the only one that turned around and said, you think I'm joining the army? I've got a father in the Gay Gordons, a brother in the Queens. What do you expect me to join? Whereupon my father hit me. So I probably then go and join Barclays Bank, being having been the world's worst barrister, go out to Uganda and probably get shot. And the sympathy for the family was close to zero. Uh, so uh, quite pathetic. Never let me anywhere near uh, armed items. He always ends up going the wrong way. And I didn't even manage to defend the Barclays branch very well either. Uh, it got uh, mortared. So uh, uh, that was the end of my uh, banking career in, in Uganda. And have you still got some of the bits and pieces in your leg? Well, I was going to, I've got those bits of Volkswagen in it, which are quite a lot to come out. I was going to send it back to, with a, a sort of note saying, could they reassemble it, please? Um, I have to say, it was very impressive, because after the car got shot up, you started it, and it worked! I can't imagine if I'd actually had the average British Midland, British Leyland car out there, and someone had even fired a pea shooter at it, the whole thing would have stopped forever. This thing actually managed to work, it was quite remarkable. So, uh, yes, I owe the German something, um, and as for the rest of the bits of metal, well, I'm afraid they're all British made, because the, the guns that, that actually had been given to the troops to use were supplied by the Foreign Office. And uh, it turned out that most of the bullets, some had sawn the tip off, which didn't really help very much, so thanks a lot, mate. Anyway, I'm it's fine now, thank you. Brilliant, and you've still got a Morris Minor parked outside your house in Hammersmith, is that right? It's a Morris Traveller, that's oh, it, sorry. 1964 Morris Traveller, there we are. It's, uh, it goes as bad as, about as fast as I do, actually. So um, anyway, I'm not going to get done for speeding with that one. Brilliant. And the uh, final question is, before we get onto the real meat of it, um, those red braces, the red tyre, <laughs> etc. Accident or uh, proper branding? I got stuck with it. And of course, once you get stuck with it, you actually realise it actually ends up being quite good branding. Most of them are my father's old braces. Um, but uh, you suddenly find yourself with a whole load of them because they're all attached to your trousers. Very difficult though, when they actually tell you actually to then sort of start examining you in airports and saying, would you mind taking your braces off? You say, we well, attached to your trousers. You have to take your trousers down. And that causes a whole load of problems. But that's another story. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, now um, the one thing you were really, um, really hot on was fees in the uh, stock market and uh, fees. I remember you saying once that five to six percent of fees uh, are used uh, each year and that's that's criminal that could be all your all your profits and that's why you started uh, Seven Investment Management I believe. Is, is that right and is that yeah. still the case? Fundamentally, that was, the, that was the main reason, because you didn't actually know what you were being charged. Some of the stockbrokers still produce, as one stockbroker, I shouldn't mention his name, but Brian Dolphin, to be unprofessional, actually produce a booklet on charges. An entire booklet? Because by the time you'd actually had not just trading commissions, but annual charges for nominee charges, uh, pension charges, ISA charges, and then Barclays, because they'd taken over the business we'd set up after Big Bang, Barclays then at Barclays Stockbrokers introduced an inactivity fee, which was brilliant. So you get charged for doing something, then you get charged for doing nothing. My view was you should have one fee for the family based on the value. If it goes up, you earn more. If it goes down, you earn less. That's it. And since we set up seven, a lot of people have now moved in the same direction. Um, and it's now become simpler and easier. But be wary. There are still lots and lots of underlying costs and charges. Like the fund management industry, for example, they used to have something known as total expense ratios, TERs, which didn't include the total expenses and wasn't a ratio. 
Now they have just annual management charges, but even they vary. Uh, so be very careful indeed. Our, nasty, our industry has a nasty habit of, it's a technical term, you have, um, what is it, it's in line. And uh, they still have a nasty habit of doing so. So be wary, particularly now, after what's happened over the past few months, returns are going to be very mean indeed and lean. And unfortunately, I'm interested to see how many of the uh, investment houses adjust their charges accordingly. I doubt it. Okay. And uh, so uh, next question is, so you've left seven and you're setting up uh, local stock exchanges and that sort of <laughs> thing online or is that, uh, did I get that wrong as usual? Well, I don't, it's, it's the idea, I mean, a bit of history here. Uh, first of all, back in 1945, which I know you remember quite well, but there's, Very back well. in 1945, there were 45 stock exchanges in Britain. Now, most of them were absolutely useless. Um, so forget that. There ended up being seven regional stock exchanges. Um, but even that's an issue. But they've all closed down now. There's now just the London Stock Exchange. Now, the primary purpose of the stock exchange is to do one thing the primary thing, which is to raise capital for business in the most cost-efficient manner possible. That's it, that's it. Everything else is secondary, buying and selling shares and all those sort of bits and pieces is after that. London has forgotten how to do that. So if you actually want to raise money for business, actually on the London Stock Exchange, well, unless you have to be a large corporation, you haven't got a hope. The alternative investment market was actually started by six of us in Glasgow to really overcome this, to actually go back to the basics of it. And London got very annoyed with it eventually, took it over themselves, moved it back down to London, doubled the charges and costs on it, and what you've ended up with is a bugger's muddle. So what I want to do now, and it's actually quite suitable time for it, although I have no concept of a virus turning up, is to go back to the concept of actually saying, regionally, in the regions, you should be able to raise money for local business in a cost-effective manner. How do you do that? And the answer is, well, you get together the local uh, professional consults the corporate advisors who are the uh, the accountants and solicitors who get very frustrated who get when they find businesses get to a certain size and then probably get a London. You then have to find local investors, private investors, and I don't mean widows and orphans, but more sophisticated ones, maybe family offices and such like, and maybe local institutions. And then you find local businesses and local businesses who actually want to have longer term equity and debt capital without going through the cost of going through London. And you see it, there's a demand for it. And lo and behold, it comes as no surprise, but there is. So we're looking at starting the first one of these, probably in Midlands and, and uh, Birmingham, West Midlands. Um, we were also looking at Newcastle, but we'll get one going first and then operate it locally. So it has its own local branding, um, but actually control it centrally to actually minimize the cost. And actually the government thinks this is quite a good idea because obviously the Boris is desperate to try and get more money into the regions. After all, he won those seats. Now he's got to get some capital into them. Of course, hasn't got any. This is one way of doing it. So the current proposal is maybe we actually come up with a sort of West Midlands ISA or a West Midlands EIS or whatever it happens to be for the region just to encourage more local investment into local businesses. That's the idea of it. So we're right at the start of that process. And so far, it's all going down quite well. So we'll have to wait and see just how it works. So it should take two or three months yet, I suspect. Fantastic. Let's, um, let's go to the real meat. So what's going to happen to the UK economy, the stock market and life after lockdown? Ah, it's going to be brilliant. It's going to be, it's going to be I haven't got a clue. Um, no, no one's got a sudden clue. Basically, we're going to have to be in a position where we're probably going to need something close to a new deal or a Marshall Plan, except this time including Britain, um, uh, to try and actually uh, activate this. Because this is a global issue. This isn't just you know, a local recession or anything like that. It's not a banking crisis. This is a different beast altogether. So what do we look like at the other end of it? Um, and so what do you have to try and do? Well, it's actually what is already being done. And there are all, going to be all sorts of mistakes being made. First of all, you have to make sure you keep the system going as much as you possibly can. So that, even though it goes into a form of economic cardiac arrest, when we get to the Bjorn lockdown, actually we can start re reviving the, the body again to get the economy moving. And that means opening up all the taps in terms of capital, making sure that employment mechanisms are kept as open as possible. So things like furloughs are a good idea. And it's going to be really very difficult to, to be able to actually manage our way through. There's going to be lots of mistakes. It's going to cost a fortune. Um, and in terms of our debt, it goes up very significantly. Now, I, 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 there are no graphs, so I can't, it doesn't really help very much. But if I say that the debt to GDP ratio, that's say the debt of the country to the value of the economy, before we went through the period of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, controls over the past decade, it was around about 88, 90%. It got down to 82%. 
uh, which is a little bit better. It's now going to be up about over 150%, maybe going higher than that. But we've been there before. If you go back to the Second World War, it was over 250%. If you want to go back even further, actually, our post Bonaparte, it was 200%. Um, so the point is, you can actually have this level of debt so long as you can service it. So good news at the moment, we can service it because the cost of money is not just cheap in real terms, it's negative, lower than the rate of inflation. And government debt, British government debt, is seen as trustworthy. We've never reneged on our debt. Virtually every other leading uh, state in the world has at some stage or another. So we're trusted. But that doesn't mean we get free money. You still have to pay for it. The other strange thing that's gone on over the years, of course, we've had this thing called quantitative easing, which is a wonderful charade of the government making up its own money. At the moment, of the interest we pay on our debt at the moment, uh, a really high proportion of it is actually the debt already owned by the government. So every year we have to actually pay over 20 billion of interest to ourselves from ourselves. You couldn't make this up. Um, but actually we're on this rather perverse world where actually governments can actually produce this money and they're gonna have to be supporting uh, companies and supporting infrastructure. And it's gonna be interesting to see how they go about this because traditionally in Britain, you regard that as, oh my God, that's nationalization, you can't do that. Or is it actually building up a portfolio of government assets um, because they are seen as strategic things to invest in? Hmm, depending on your political view as to how you want to try and do it. That is already happening in Japan. The largest holder of Japanese bonds in the Japanese bond market is the Japanese government. One of the largest purchaser of Japanese shares in, in Japan is the Japanese government. They are doing precisely that. And I suspect you're going to be seeing more of that occurring in the States, whether they've been doing that with corporate bonds, and you'll be seeing that starting over here as well. Why are you doing it? The answer is because actually we're short of alternatives. Um, otherwise, you are going to go into a form of depression. Now, the problem is you can't go around talking about depression because, remember, the world runs on that one word, confidence. So if you don't have confidence, nothing happens. But the difference between realistic confidence and a confidence trick, well, the trouble is, of course, the confidence tricks is we've got uh, a trickster in the White House, which doesn't help in the slightest because no one trusts him. Um, and we need some global leadership. And you've got China, yes, but that's not necessarily going to be leading what's going on. Not India, yes, same thing applies. The EU really is not in a position to be able to lead, and of course America should be. Um, but actually we're finding ourselves, see what happens in the election, without any proper leadership coming from that at the moment. So add that then to another issue, which is the fall in the oil price. And the oil price is an interesting issue. It's not just a matter of what you pay at the pump, uh, or how much Saudis are getting, or the Russians aren't getting, if we're trying to avoid the sniggering. Um, but actually, in the position of the, the interesting uh, sort of a measure of what happens in the future, you see the oil price drop very dramatically, it's an indicator of actually global weakness occurring. And so the recent figures, when you saw it going negative, albeit for trading reasons, um, it's actually now perked up a bit, 25 to $30 a barrel, and you'll see further cuts coming through from Saudi, I suspect, in the next few days. Um, you'll see that picking up a little bit, but nowhere near the levels we're going to be seeing from before. So it's going to be a tough time. So it's going to take clear, effective leadership. Not exactly what I saw on television last night, but nonetheless, clear, effective leadership globally um, to be able to make sure that people have the confidence when you come out here to go out and spend, to go out and invest, and companies feel that they are in a position that they too will have confidence to be able to do that. So it's a difficult situation. But nonetheless, it is manageable through it. What do investors do? As is interesting, because with investors, you can see markets going up and down like yo-yos at the moment. Should you be buying at the moment? The answer is I wouldn't be rushing. This is a classic example of bear trap territory, by which I mean markets go up because there's lots of support coming in and the companies are coming out with the bad news, but it's not as bad as we thought it was. But there are going to be an awful lot of other issues coming through on this before we're uh, sorted out. So those bear traps will be there. Um, and we're going to have to wait and see that we see considered coordinated policy beginning to have an effect. Right. Having said that, when you come across good quality companies, which are you know, in the position where they are still making money, and they're in a position where they've probably got low levels of debt, quality, not the same one particular uh, area either, um, but uh, what you'll find if you get those at lower prices, there are some good assets to be buying. But for most people at the moment, probably, if you've got cash, sit on it. You don't be making much money on cash. In fact, you'll be losing money in real terms. But that's the situation. Brilliant. Two questions there quickly. This is, a, this is a daft one from me. What's the difference between quantitative easing and printing money? And isn't that what the Germans did in 1920? 
There's no difference at all. It's printing money except with better terms. You go to an economics book of about 25 years ago, look up quantitative easing, it won't be there. Um, and uh, so it's a means of being able to produce money into the system. So it's the Bank of England and the government getting together to be able to sit there and say, right, we're, we're going to produce government gilts and then we'll buy them. And anyone who thinks the government and uh, the Bank of England's independence isn't paying attention. It is one and the same. So is it a trick in terms of a fiat currency you know, based on paper um, and uh, the paper value is, well, whatever you think it's going to be. Um, it's not actually backed by gold or anything like that. But there's nothing new in that. That's, that's how we've worked the paper system for years. Uh, does it mean we're going to be heading for a huge amount of inflation in those areas? Well, we can't see it at the moment. That's not to say that couldn't change, but it's very, un, it's very deflationary at the moment, which in terms of actually borrowing money is good value. But in the medium term, Governments will actually quite like a bit of inflation because how do you get rid of debt? Inflate it away, but not yet. And uh, final question from me, property prices, what's going to happen to them? Now, whereabouts? If you're a city in London, they've already gone down quite a lot. Um, basically, property prices will, of course, depend upon demand. Where's the demand coming from? If people have no confidence and if they feel that their jobs are changing, am I going to have to commute into London or a city every single day or do I work from home? This is all going to change the structure really quite radically indeed. Am I going to go on public transport over the next few months, years? Is that going to change? It's fundamentally changing the way we work. So it's going to be very difficult indeed. So are you going to see huge demand for property? The answer is no. We've all, but this is not to do with the virus necessarily. You've already seen retail being very weak for the past 18 months anyway. That's going to continue. Light industry, well, that hasn't been too bad. But again, that's going to be very weak for the time being because there won't be much demand there. there. And in terms of office space, of course, that's going to be fascinating in the city at the moment when you see the number of jobs that are going in the city and are unlikely to be coming back with the same numbers that have gone. So I think that's actually going to be really very weak indeed. But on the other hand, for those who are actually sitting on their property as their home, it is their home. It's not an investment. It's their home and enjoy the home. And, uh, but as for things like the buy-to-let market, I'm afraid that had already died anyway. Okay, Justin, that's, that's fantastic. I'm going to switch now and give you a rest for a minute. All questions in the chat box, please. I know a couple of people sent them in by email, but if you can put those uh, questions in the chat box, that will be fantastic. Um, as you know, this is the fourth time we've had Ali, the uh, physio, on uh, uh, to give us some stretching exercises because we're uh, working from home and all that. We're doing all the wrong things, I expect. So, Ali, thanks for joining us yet again. Well, thanks for asking me back again, Derek. Thanks, that was absolutely fantastic, Justin. Uh, follow that. <laughs> hey, um, so you're talking about investment and all that kind of thing. I'm gonna talk about a little bit of time and investment in your, in your body and your health. Because I think what's suffering for all of us at the moment is we're not moving enough. Sorry if you've heard me say this before. We're all at home, we're not, we're working at desks we're not used to, we're not moving em enough. And I keep getting emails from people asking me, what can I do to get a bit fitter, stop myself aching? Um, I haven't got any equipment, I can't go to the gym, so what do you do? So my answer is you can always do something, and I've got my trusty water bottle here. So you can fill your water bottle, just get it around the right way, not upside down. <laughs> fill your trusty water bottle with a bit of water, and then you can do some bicep curls. Stand there in between your phone calls, do a, or your video calls, bicep curls, tricep curls, strengthen your arms a bit, up above the head. So you can, my basic um, point is you can improvise, you can use anything. You can use your dog, your cat, your water bottle, but basically move. If you just move a little bit, you really will reap the benefits. And I think, um, you know, concentration suffers as well as the body getting a bit stiff and a bit tired. Um, use, so use it, make it work, and then it will pay you dividends and you'll be able to um, work much better and function better. And there you are, there's my tip. Just move and use a few tips, use a few um, things from home. Anything you can find, really. Thank and you. remind us, what's the ultimate uh, time to sit at your desk hunched over? What, how often should we move? No, no time. <laughs> but, however, if you're going to sit at your desk, move after 30 minutes. Put your watch on, put your phone on and just get yourself up and walk around the chair, make a cup of tea, do a few stretches. Um, it all makes a difference, but 30 minutes is long enough, really. Fantastic. Justin, are you ready for a few questions? Yeah, I'm just trying to I love the idea of actually exercising with the cat. Go and get her if you like and show you just a few push ups like this. <laughs> it's going to get stuck on the ceiling with its claws. That'd be true. <laughs> Thank you, I'll be doing that.
First question, Justin, is a um, yep. technical question, but we'll take them in order from John. Will Justin's regional investment scheme offer tax relief to venture capital trusts, 30% refund, tax-free, etc.? Uh, John, that depends on what the government allows us to do. What we've asked for, and actually they're quite interested in, is the idea of actually providing a, a ISA support and potentially EIS relief. Um, and so the reason that's quite of interest to them is it doesn't actually cost them anything. Um, which is why governments actually prefer ISAs over pensions, because they don't have to pay any money out in advance. When it comes to VCTs and things like that, we'll have to wait and see. It would be useful, uh, a useful operation for VCTs to be able to use, um, whether we'll get them involved in it um, and whether they'll get the, get the benefits from it, I have to wait and see. I have to get the process working first. Um, they, at the moment, won't bother until it's actually operational, and then they'll come and, come and use it. So we'll have to wait and see. But certainly the demand we've got from all three groups, the professional advisors, the companies wanting investing, and the potential investors, certainly in the West Midlands, seems to be very strong. Fantastic. Next question from Mark. Um, what do you feel about the small pharma stocks which specialise in COVID-19 related issues, testing ventilators and vaccines? It's interesting to try and see how they can try and develop these things. What, just let me take that question slightly to one side. What you're going to see, I think, is a great reduction in the uh, trade routes that we've seen before. We've all been used to long supply lines. Why? Because they work. You can have things made in China in a few days' time. It's arrived and it's very cheap. Now, if the assumption is that, well, we've had this virus, but anything else could occur, how am I, am I going to go back and build that again and risk it occurring again? Or am I going to have shorter time production lines, shorter production lines, closer to home, so I don't have to do it? The answer is, yes, I probably will. Not for everything, but for quite a lot of those things. Does it mean I'm going to be making iPhones in Isleworth? The answer is no, um, but it does mean that other things could be made locally. So go back to PPE equipment and things like that. Uh, and the ability for companies to say, actually, we can produce this locally at the right standard and not obviously the quality standards produced by Turkey or whatever it was the other day, which failed. Um, then there's every good reason to say, here is a business case for us to be able to do that. And so I look forward to actually seeing more businesses um, actually focusing on this as something they can actually try and provide. Great. And from Gabby, how many companies in the city have already decided to let, lo let a lot of, um, lot of office space go? Uh, tell the truth, I don't know, but I'd be um, very surprised if that isn't being actively considered at the moment. Problem being is actually what you'll find is most of the course will be stuck into leases, which they won't be able to get out of too easily. Um, how many of them will be using their break uh, clause to be able to uh, find themselves get out of it? Most of them you'll find will probably be on a five year basis. So it's going to be eight to ten year lease with a four to five year break point. I suspect you'll find quite a lot of them will be saying uh, actually we'll be using uh, uh, less of that space and not taking up new space. And of course, there is a whole lot more still due to come through um, over the past few months. The new Bishopsgate buildings, I think, are just opening up at the moment. Um, but I feel like an old partner. I haven't been in there for now, what, nearly about four months, I suppose. Yeah. Um, from John, why hasn't the, F, the FTSE and the pound not fallen further? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, well, the FTSE, first of all, remember the FTSE is a global index, but we all know that. It's not a UK index uh, overall. Um, and what you've seen is the main impact of the small number of large companies. So the ones that we knew about that would have an impact, the commodity companies, oil companies, banks, and things like that, uh, to a great extent, had a lot of that already been, been affected anyway. What you're going to see more damage with the FTSE is actually with the fall off the dividend supplies coming through. Of course, that's a real worry, I think, for people in terms of longer term returns. Remember, in the longer term, your returns were not from your capital prices going up, but actually from the compounding of the dividends coming through. And you've got a much, much lower level of dividends. That means our longer term returns are going to be that much smaller overall. So uh, that's, that's one issue there. Now, compare that to seeing the fall in, in London. Look at what's happened with the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has actually just gone past uh, actually where it started at the beginning of the year. Not the peak, but the start of the beginning of the year. Why? Because the expectation is that technology is going to fulfill it all. Well, it will do, yes. It's dominated by a very small number of, uh, of uh, high-tech companies. Um, be wary. That is a fashion fad. Yes, of course, the tech will be there, but be careful. When it comes to the pound, bear in mind the pound as value is as uh, relation to the euro in relation to the dollar. In comparison to those two currencies, it's very small, and so it bounces around. Uh, so therefore, against the, the dollar, uh, has it weakened a bit? Well, it went up to 130, it's been down to 120. 
go back to the vote when we had for the um, uh, for, for Brexit. Remember, before that, it was nearly at 150 and went down eventually to below 120. So uh, actually, we've been sitting around about the same sort of level. Um, so it's dependent upon the other currencies. The euro is going to remain weak. Why? Because there's serious concerns still about the future of the euro, which I know we've discussed before. Unless you can actually run that single central bank properly, uh, running a single currency, it's still going to remain, have a longer term question mark over it. Um, and as the US at the moment, well, of course, it's still going to remain relatively weak. So the pound bumps in the middle of it at the moment. No one of them is going to be stronger than the others at the moment. But we won't be leading that pack, I'm afraid, for some time to come. OK, from Will. Her Majesty's Government have given away billions. It's real cash. Is it coming from QE uh, or are we borrowing it? I think you may have touched on this already, but if we are borrowing it, who's lending to the government? Yeah, we're borrowing it. Um, who are we borrowing it from? Domestic institutions, international, international institutions. Why? Because we're giving a return, which is still seem to be valuable, uh, opposed to buying German bonds at the moment, which are currently negative. Um, so you're being paid to hold them. So, you know, that's why people would, uh, would be buying UK bonds, but they're not buying it on the basis of great return, because in real terms, again, after inflation, it's still pretty thin. But then also, as we talked about a little earlier, the issue of quantitative easing, we're producing our own debt as well, um, uh, albeit uh, by, by the joy and by the magic of QE. Um, but then also with that, one of the things we were proposing, why don't we have our own um, corona bonds, a bit like war bonds? That was the one proposal we actually put to the Treasury. Why not, for those of us who can't work in hospitals or ambulances and things like that, create a corona bond, make it an inflation-proof bond, a linker, uh, and actually give people then maybe a bonus after five years as a loyalty bonus to actually people participate in it and actually raise money to support this debt. And that would be a constructive thing to do, which is not just raising money for the government, but also actually creating a level of involvement in it as well, which I think would be, would be created. I like that. That sounds a great idea. Let's bring it on. Um, Going back to Brexit, uh, Keith asks, and I know that uh, you were pretty surprised when the vote went uh, to leave. Um, I remember you telling me that. Um, at the end of the year, do you think there'll be an extension? Is that just bluff or will there be an extension? Uh, I'm afraid that an awful lot of our government can, does consist of fluff and bluff. Um, so I've no idea what's going to happen with that at the moment. Um, I, Log logic, and logic is not necessarily something that drives what the decision making here, would say don't rush. No, there's no reason at all why you can't actually put these back a little bit further with agreement in terms of costs and ongoing costs and things like that. Um, but unfortunately in a position at the moment where there is a dogma to say that we must get these completed by a certain time. Um, realistically, it'd be much better to get the good negotiating skills of yourself to be able to sit there and say, look, let's actually have a length, longer period of time. We're not going to necessarily have to pay a whole lot more for this. Uh, we'll prepare a reasonable proportion of it, but get the right deal rather than necessarily the rushed deal just to try and get the dogma done by a certain date, um, which I always think is a, a rather silly way to try and find yourself, find a position to find yourself in. Well, I sent both Prime Ministers a copy of my book. I got a nice letter back, but I don't think they've read it because I don't think they got past the preparation uh, <laughs> page. But um, I better not say things like that. Uh, yes, you should. Yes, you should. <laughs> OK. Uh, from Martin, what's your view on what will happen with unemployment uh, as we get back to new normal? Yes, um, unemployment. As I know I'm talking about our unemployment. You saw the eye-watering figures out of America last week. Uh, they were talking about 14%. The real figures are, in fact, because the way they calculate, they're probably closer to just under 20%. Uh, and you're back to figures we haven't seen since the 30s, which is really just appalling. What happens to our unemployment here? Well, we've got the furlough system, which will mean that some people will be coming back. Do all those people come back? The answer is, I suspect, probably not. Um, companies will be adjusting and changing accordingly. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult. Where is the primary growth area for, uh, for employment? The answer is going to be back in small businesses again. Hence the focus. We must make sure there is more capital available for there to enable people to be able to sit there and say, well, they may be small local businesses, they need capital, they'll take some employment, um, and encouraging people to do that. That's what we had to go through before, and it was actually really rather successful. Some through our own best efforts, others because companies are just laying off people and saying we don't need to employ them, we're outsourcing. And we're going to have to carry on doing that. Remember, Britain was actually setting up more smaller businesses over the past few years than Germany and France put together 
we were far more entrepreneurial than they have ever been, which is really quite remarkable because we didn't actually have a history of that. Um, our history was much more one of, tended to be sadly over the past few years, of large corporations. Um, but now that has changed. We mustn't lose the magic of that because that will be one of the ways to give us greater flexibility of employment coming back uh, and to be able to have more innovation, but it will require more investment. Brilliant. Last question. What's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you on television or on the radio? <laughs> How long have you got? Um, I, there's one, there is something which I'm pleased to say isn't on YouTube or Google or anything like that. It like, will be God, in a minute. Please, be careful. please don't go and find the sodding thing. I had to go on and I was on a queue for News 24, news channel as it was then in years back. And I was standing behind some young lady who was a, a lawyer and she went in front of me and, and I assumed up there she was on screen there was going to be the Aston little sign coming up underneath and it was going to see uh, Miss So-and-so, So-and-so from Sue Grabbit Run. And up came, you know, Justin Elkett Stewart from uh, uh, Seven Investment Management, or it might have been Barclays in those days, I can't remember. Um, and I thought, oh, sod it, obviously I'm going to go on next and I will be her, which is fine. She's been very nice, I can dress up as well. Anyway, she fits her interview, I then went on, started doing that. And I happened to notice on the uh, screen, which you shouldn't be looking at, that actually as I was burbling away, up came my Aston. What did it say? Slobodan Milosevic, ex-president of Serbia. <laughs> Even the director came up and said, just, I'm terribly sorry about that. You know, I did, it's an honest mistake. I said, look, I've never done a lot of things wrong, but mass murder is not one of them. Yes! Could you make sure that doesn't go on Google? Anyway, that was the most embarrassing one. Fantastic, fantastic. Justin, we've come, almost come to the end of uh, our recording. Uh, would you stay on for a few questions from people? Uh, if I ask them and uh, we turn the recording off. I just wanted to mention tomorrow morning, Graham Jones and I are running a top masterclass. We are going to have to speak at the same speed as Graham Jones because we normally run it 17 minutes, uh, uh, 17 sessions in London. That's been cancelled. But the next one will be in, um, on the uh, 3rd of November. So please join us. Uh, a lady called Susie is coming all, all the way from China for it. So that's how popular Graham and I are. So please join us then. Influencing skills on... Um, on Wednesday, the work of Robert Giordini. So please join me then. And on Thursday, I've got uh, some special guests. They don't know who they are yet, and nor do I, but they'll be very special, I can guarantee. <laughs> so uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, I look forward to Justin. We're going to have to get you back on here again at some stage. And uh, let's uh, see, what, uh, see what's happened. Thanks very much indeed, Justin. Really appreciate that. My pleasure.